Hello and welcome to episode 351 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox. That's Ben Olson. Together we're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. This episode will air on Monday, May 23rd, still a full month away from the August 2022 LSAT registration deadline. That's on Tuesday, June 28th. So no decisions need to be made anytime uh, in the next month. We have always every other Thursday, we have some um, free shit for you. Go to LSATdemon.com and register for a free account. You can come to one of my free classes every other Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. I used to call that the study group, but now I'm starting to do some more interesting stuff. This week, I'm doing something called One Hour LSAT, where I help people build uh, study plans. And in future weeks, you're going to see us doing all sorts of different things. Uh, if you missed it, you can go to lsatdemon.com and you can look at Rachel Gezerse's How to Get a Law Job You Love. That's actually happening this Saturday, uh, but it'll be too late by the time you hear this podcast to join us live. You can, though, watch the recording of that class, lsat.link slash Rachel, and you'll be able to um, see a video of that class about uh, networking your way into an actual law job. Today on the show, we dove uh, <laughs> deep into a conversation that we were having last week, trying to figure out how heavily law schools are weighting LSAT to GPA based on their index formulas. Yeah, we we waited out to uh, we walked out to the edge of the deep end. Um, we hadn't put on our swimsuits yet. We just kind of had our clothes on and then jumped in to the deep <laughs> end and started like messing around with like these concepts and we'll see how that goes. Yeah, we are not data analysts and um, but we did get very helpful emails. People emailed in help at thinkinglsat.com. So I want to thank um, Sean and Dante for writing us in and trying to help us arrive at some certainty at how heavily law schools are weighting LSAT to GPA. Maybe they are not um, weighting it as heavily as we thought they were. You know, I, I would say though, pretty good rule of thumb is probably twice LSAT, two times GPA, roughly. Plus, as we ultimately ended up coming around to, LSAT's the one thing that you can actually do something about. If you're not still in undergrad, yeah. you can change your LSAT a lot. And you should be thinking about LSAT more than you're thinking about anything else. Boy, Ben, Once one of our- you have your GPA on record. And, and, and I really want to stress that you should be thinking about that shit way, way more than you're thinking about personal statements. I looked at a, a personal statement last night for a friend and it, it was not good. I didn't think. But I also just don't think it matters. I, like, I, I just can't imagine that it really matters because most people apply to law school with shitty personal statements mm -hmm. we or see them something all the time. that yep. something I would consider shitty, something Ben would consider shitty. Most people at most law schools have a personal statement that mo that we would consider shitty, <laughs> including our own personal statements that we actually used. Ben and I both had shitty personal statements when we applied X years ago and it didn't hurt us. So GPA, if you're still in undergrad. If you're not still an undergrad, then you need to put all your eggs in the LSAT basket, because that's the thing that you can really improve a lot. 10, 15, 20 point LSAT improvements are not uncommon. And that's, you know, regardless of what the actual math works out to how heavily law schools are weighting LSAT in their index calculations, that's one thing that you can really affect. Yeah. So we had a lengthy discussion about that at the top of the show. It gets a little data heavy. Uh, you y'all might find yourself skipping some of that, <laughs> to be honest. We had a couple uh, emails from international students and we wrapped up with an email from somebody who um, was telling a bit of a convoluted sob story kind of about an F on their transcript and trying to figure out whether they should write an addendum. And our strong advice was do not <laughs> bring people's focus <laughs> to the worst part of your application by writing that addendum you should just yeah focus on your strengths rather than uh, pointing out your weaknesses anything else that we need to talk about oh we are still hiring we're always hiring um we've got like three teachers going to yale this fall and like three other teachers going to harvard this fall 
Yep. And they're hopefully going to stick around and um, teach once they get their feet on the ground in their 1L year. But in the meantime, we do need um, some 99th percentile scorers at lsatdemon.com. So uh, please send me your score report. That's a 99th percentile official LSAT score report and a video of you teaching maybe one logical reasoning question, maybe one logic game. We love hiring our listeners and our former students to teach for us. So please, uh, you can send that to me to me directly. I'm Nathan at lsatdemon.com. All right. At uh, lsat.link slash index, we have been attempting to try to figure out, based on law school's own index formulas, how heavily they weight LSAT versus GPA. We talked about it a lot on the show. We asked you, the listeners, for your feedback, and we got a handful of thoughtful um, emails all coming at it from totally different directions. We don't understand. Ben and I do not (laughs) understand. We had a little meeting before the recording this morning, and it is clear that we do not understand this issue. But that's what we have you guys for. So we're going to read these emails, and we're going to talk our way through some of um, your various analyses of this issue. And we're going to, as always, invite you to email help at thinkinglsat.com to uh, try to help us continue to get closer to a real answer on this. Yeah. Want to get to Dante's email? Yeah, let's do this. All right. So Dante says, hey, guys, I just looked at the spreadsheet you talked about on the show. Again, that's lsat.link forward slash index if you're still with us. I think that your analysis is technically correct, but it doesn't really account for the minimum and maximum UGPA and LSAT scores. In the attached spreadsheet, I compared the maximum index and the minimum index for LSAT scores, keeping UGPA at 4.0, and then the same for UGPA with LSAT staying at 180. The difference between the two index scores for each school should show how much LSAT or UGPA can sway the index. I compared the two on the summary tab to see which has more power to control your index for each school. The school has stayed in the same order when sorting LSAT over UGPA, but the amount of weight LSAT has versus G- UGPA is lower. Overall, I think the point is the same. LSAT is definitely given more weight, but maybe not quite to the caliber that is shown by comparing the coefficients. I also recognize that my analysis could be flawed or that there is a better way. So let me know what you guys think. Thanks for the demon and the podcast. I'm super glad I found you guys first in my prep, Dante. I'm I'm looking at Dante's spreadsheet now. Yeah, he's trying to do a sensitivity analysis. He's holding one of the variables constant, changing the other variable and seeing how much it changes the index. And then doing the same in the reverse. And then doing the same in reverse and then comparing the amount that it changes, I think. Yeah. To, to see what the weightings are, and maybe that's where he's getting this LSAT weight number. Okay. So he's comparing going from a 120 to a 180, and then comparing going from a 2.0 maybe to a 4.0, yeah. or he's going from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. Yeah. His analysis, he so he's coming up with, and, and this is not the first time we've seen this, where he's coming up with Berkeley 0.8. So he, he's he's saying that, Berkeley weights LSAT eight tenths as much as GPA. Yep. Yep. Which um, Sean's analysis, I think, arrives at that same number. So this is two people who seem to understand data who are arriving at the same number, which probably means that Ben and I are wrong. Yeah. Hmm. You want to read uh, Sean's take on it? So so Dante's analysis, by the way, just to just to give the punchline of Dante, Dante says, well, There's very few schools, maybe one school that weights GPA more heavily than LSAT. Maybe Berkeley does. Mm -hmm. All other schools are weighting LSAT significantly more heavily, just not as much as we thought. Like back to our original analysis, you know, back to our like default before we even did any analysis, which was LSAT's more important than GPA. We're not sure how much. Dante says, well, one and three quarters times at most schools. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Here's Sean. Okay. 
Hi guys, listening to your most recent podcast, the skeptic in me was hesitant to believe the schools were giving LSAT scores up to 10 times more weight than GPA in their index formulae, which by the way is a usage from the 1800s. Thanks Nathan (laughs) for perpetuating We've learned that that we don't have to use that word, which is good. I was like, do I have to? I sound like a douche. And I was, no, you don't have to. Yep. So formulas is the modern standard for that. Yes. Okay. So being a cynic and a data nerd, I took to getting to the bottom of this methodology. I began by gathering the index formula values for the 2021 to 2022 application cycle directly from LSAC link here and ended up joining this data to the law school LSAT and GPA median data provided by seven sage. He again provides the link limiting the data to jump to just the top 100 schools. Okay, only 84 of which had index formula data available through LSAC. Okay, so there I ask why, right? Yep. That's that's a point in the analysis where I'm like, wait, you what? You joined the, I understand why you want the index data, the index formulas, because <laughs> that's ultimately like where the, L, the law school is telling us what's important, right? So our analysis is based solely on that, right? I mean, it's like, hey, if you're going to equate these numbers, here's what you would have to, here's what your index formula would look like. So now Sean is taking it and, and Dante was too, because Dante was looking at the 25th, 50th, 75th percentiles for these schools. So maybe what they're doing is they're comparing actual applicants versus other actual applicants. And I don't know that that's actually what you should be doing. Well, because the question is, whatever numbers you have, what effect does the ELSA have, right? What effect does the GPA have, e- even if you're outside the normal range of applicants? So he's looking at median LSATs and GPAs. Yep. For the top 100 schools, using you know the 84 of which who have index formula data, uh, index formulas available through LSAC. Okay, now what's he gonna do? Once I had all the necessary data. I loaded the Excel file into a Python script to perform sensitivity analysis on the index formulae. The end goal of this exercise was to run each school's index formula against a sample of LSAT and GPA combinations to see what effect those two parameters have on the final index value. Yes, which is exactly what we're trying to figure out. Um, You know, what change in LSAT? No, it's not even change in LSAT. It's just what LSAT score does compared to the GPA. Anyways, I assume that GPAs ranged from 2.0 to 4.0 and the LSAT scores ranged from 120 to 180. Sounds like good assumptions. Going by a 0.01 point increments, sorry, going by 0.01 point increments for GPA, this resulted in 12,261 possible LSAT GPA combinations. Mm-hmm. because there are 201 GPAs between mm-hmm. 2.0 and 4.0 and 61 LSAT scores between 120 and 180. I then calculated an index value for those 12,261 samples using each of the 84 schools' unique index formula. Once those index values were calculated, I used the SALIB Python package, Salib <laughs> Python package, to run a Sobel sensitivity analysis on the results. Okay, I don't understand any of that. This analysis resulted in a pair of what are called total order sensitivity values for each school with one value for LSAT and one value for GPA. Total order sensitivity values are a numerical representation of how much influence a variable has on the output of a formula equation, exactly what I was looking for. Exclamation, exclamation point. point. Excited. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> okay. Lastly, I calculated a ratio of LSAT total order sensitivity to GPA total order sensitivity for each school. This ratio represents the amount of importance a school places on an applicant's LSAT score compared to GPA. In broad strokes, I'm kind of understanding what you're doing, even though, you know, I don't know Python, okay, you're you're running a script because you've got huge numbers of combinations and you need to whatever. Sobol sensitivity analysis, I have no idea what that is. I started looking it up on Wikipedia and it was some very complicated math that I didn't understand. 
I also want to understand, does it matter whether you have 12,261 possible combinations or if you just truncate this down to 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, would you get different results? Like to me, that doesn't seem to matter. Right. Like the, like the number of clicks on the scale, I don't see how that matters if all we're really doing is trying to e equate, <laughs> if we're trying to balance the fact that LSAT is on a much higher scale than GPA, I just don't understand why the number of clicks on the scale is relevant to this discussion. Here are his findings. Drum roll, Sean says, unfortunately, for you guys as an LSAT company and for myself as a splitter with a mediocre engineering GPA, schools do not weigh LSAT scores five to 10 times more than GPA. In fact, it's not even close to that according to my analysis. Of the 84 schools whose index formulae were analyzed, the highest weighting of LSAT to GPA was University of Arizona at 2.2, sorry, 2.11. So University of Arizona weighs the LSAT twice as much as GPA, and that was his highest school, apparently. And the lowest weighting of LSAT to GPA was Berkeley at 0 0.81. And yeah, that's the same number that... Uh, All these numbers are the exact same as what Dante came up with. Yeah. So Arizona considers the LSAT to be 2.11 times as important as GPA, while Berkeley thinks that the LSAT is only 81% as important as GPA, something we've seen empirically through their history of unfriendliness towards splitters. Okay, I don't know about that. I don't have that empirical data, but... I Yeah, I, I only have it anecdotally, yeah. which is maybe what Sean meant. But I But yeah, I mean, I have always thought that if you're a 180 and a 3.0 Berkeley's probably not the school for you. Yeah. You know, like that's more like you got a better chance at UCLA. Yeah. Because that I've always, I've always had in my head UCLA as a school that tends to weight LSAT more important and Berkeley as a school that tends to weight GPA more important, but continue because as it, Berkeley really does start to seem like an outlier here. Across the 84 schools sampled, the average and median ratios were 1.78 and 1.82, respectively. Isn't that like exactly or just like super close to what Dante came up with? But they're doing very, very similar analyses. Okay. Yep. Given that the LSAT is a more standardized metric than GPA, it makes sense that schools tend to put more emphasis on it when calculating index values. However, schools are not putting nearly as much emphasis on LSAT scores as your initial analysis suggested. I have attached the spreadsheet detailing my findings along with the Python script I created to perform this analysis. I welcome any comments or criticisms and am open to discussion about the appropriate appropriateness of my methodology, exclamation point. As always, thank you both for your help you pro provide to LSAT students, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Okay, thank you, Sean. That's interesting that they both came up with similar results. Maybe the increments don't matter in terms of the final numbers. They just um, increase the degree of accuracy of the analysis. Like the it numbers gives you are more data points to test against each other. Sure. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I, I, I thank you, Dante. Thank you, Sean. Thank you listeners for bearing with this discussion. We sometimes have a tone that indicates that we know everything I want to assure you that that is not how we actually feel. You know what, though, Ben? We are capable of learning this shit. And that, I, I, there's, there's a, to tease out like an actual LSAT lesson here, mm. you're not meant to be a fucking data, ana data analyst when you're an attorney, but you are meant to be able to figure shit out. Like you're, you are meant to be able to listen to testimony from credible experts in a field and you you're meant to be able to like read through their documentation and understand what's going on. There's no like fancy, you know, this isn't like um, differential equations or like some I, I don't think that the math is beyond us is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. <laughs> these data people need to like explain it for people who went to college but <laughs> didn't like major in math. That said. We, I think we can get to the bottom of it. I mean, I think that we can eventually understand what they did. Two hours later. We've been thinking about it all day and we've, uh, 
we we've come to some kind of an answer here, uh, which is the index. If it's going to put LSAT and GPA on equal footing, it has to do two things. One, it has to calculate for the magnitude difference between LSAT and GPA, which obviously that's what we've been talking about. That's where we had that 45 number because the top LSAT is 45 times as big as the top GPA. The middle LSAT, by the way, of 150 is um, 50 times as big as the middle GPA of 3.0. Assuming 2.0 is the minimum possible, you know, GPA that you can graduate from undergrad. I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Well, it's a nice clean number, even if it's a little bit of below or above. It's not perfect. Right. We never were trying to be perfect. We were trying to get as close as we can to like just understanding this issue. Right. Yeah. So let's say that the um, yeah, LSAT is on a 50 times bigger scale because middle LSAT 150 is 50 times middle GPA 3.0. But yep. the thing that we were missing, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with increments. What I think is relevant is the, the, the size of the scale. Yes, because the best GPA is twice as good as the worst GPA. 4.0 is twice as big as 2.0. Yes. So you and can double your GPA. Right, you can double point. your GPA. The worst student has half the GPA that the best student has. The best student has twice the GPA as the worst student. Okay. LSAT, no, that doesn't work that way. LSAT, the bottom of the scale is 120 and the top of the scale is 180. So the best LSAT is only 50% more than the worst LSAT. You can improve your LSAT by 50% from and 120 can... to 180. Now, you just said double for GPA, but just to put these on the... Apple, to compare apples to apples, you can increase your LSAT score by 50%. You can go from 120 to 180. You can increase your GPA by 100%. Okay, there we go. So even though the numbers on an absolute scale are smaller, mm -hmm. the relative numbers are twice as powerful on the GPA scale. Yep, they move faster or they can so, move more. Yeah. Yes. So when they do these index calculations, and again, the index formula is A times LSAT plus B times GPA plus C, which is a constant, which still does nothing. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they have to do two things at once. They're equating the differences in the, you know, it's a, well, a half an order of magnitude. Sorry, it's half two orders of magnitude, right? It's, what do you call that? One order of magnitude would be 10. Two orders of magnitude would be 100. What, what do you call it's in between one? It's one and a half 50? orders. Yeah, it's, it's one and a half orders of <laughs> magnitude, right? So yeah. it, it, it but it, it's 50 times bigger. The LSAT is 50 times bigger, but it's half as powerful. It can't change it, as much internally uh, on yeah. its own. Yeah. And so when you're just using one coefficient for each else for LSAT and a coefficient for GPA, the yeah. balance between those coefficients has to take both of those things into account. And so we have updated lsat.link slash index where we do our calculation. We now believe that in order to equally weight LSAT and GPA, and, and we're using a number right in the middle of the scale. So, you know, um, thank you, Sean, for doing, um, Sean and Dante are both doing sensitivity analyses. I think that we are sort of shortcutting that, but getting to the point by using numbers at the very middle of the scale. Mm -hmm. So if we use a 150 LSAT and a 3.0, that's, you know, the middle, very middling LSAT and a very middling GPA. If yep. we take the very middle of the scale, then 150 LSAT is 50 times 3.0 GPA. So we get this number of 50. Yeah. But then you have to divide that by two because the GPA scale is twice as strong, you know, like twice as powerful. Yes. As LSAT. So yep. LSAT is much bigger, but GPA is more powerful. So it's 50 times bigger divided by two because of GPA's strength internally. Yeah. If, if you don't divide, here's another way of thinking about it. If you take GPA and you multiply it by 50 to bring it up to the LSAT score numbers or, you know, magnitude, yep. how big LSAT numbers are. Well, great. Now you've just You've multiplied GPA by 50, but because it's this more powerful lever, right? unfortunately, now you've made it too strong. So you need to divide by right. two 
to account for the fact that it's twice as strong or can can change twice as much. Yep. And when we do this, so our new formula now for weighting, you know, how how much do law schools care about LSAT versus GPA? If they cared about LSAT and GPA exactly evenly, mm -hmm. then 50 divided by 2 divided by B divided by A would equal 1. That would be an equal weighting between LSAT and GPA. Yep. And so we've now changed LSAT.link slash index to account for all this. And we get a couple weird outlying unranked or super high ranked schools who seem to care about GPA weirdly more than they care about LSAT. We have UC Berkeley, which is at 0.93. Yep. And uh, we have Stanford 1.12. And then we have still the vast majority of schools are between two and four. Two and four. Yeah. So Wayne LSAT two to three times on average more than GPA. Uh, what is interesting about this analysis is that it brings it in line, at least for, yeah, it brings it in line for <laughs> with Dante's analysis and Sean's analysis. We're a little bit different. We're obviously doing rough back of the envelope math. They're doing regression analysis or whatever, right? They're, They're doing a sensitivity analysis, yeah. which is, is probably more correct, but at least see now this like now squares with my intuitive understanding, which was just, well, wait a second. One scale is way higher than the other scale. So you have to balance for those two. The part that I was missing, the part that, I mean, I just hope it, it, it's clear to you now, Ben. Um, I, it just, it, I had to make it make sense in my own brain is that there's, there's more distance between a 2.0 and a 4.0 than there is between a 120 and a 180. And once you account for that, now our numbers, even though we're not doing the full on sensitivity analysis, comparing all the different pairs and everything, we're just using the very square middle of the range. And, but now our analysis, like our numbers are within 10% or whatever of what Sean and Dante were coming up with, with their, um, so ball analysis and sensitivity analysis and what have you. So we're, we, um, I think we have found the truth. Okay. For everyone else out there who does not give a shit about anything that we just said. <laughs> For everyone who turned off the podcast 30 <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's the takeaway, right? Yeah. LSAT is for most schools weighted two to four, two to four more times than GPA. Yeah. It's, it's basically three times. And even then, what are you going to do about it? You, there we at go. The end Let's of the go day, back to Ben's point. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get the best GPA you can get because it's still a huge factor. And then once you get the best GPA you can get, you got to get the best LSAT score you can get. End of story. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> go to LSAT.link slash index if you want to um, <laughs> see this spreadsheet, which Ben and I have devoted too much of our lives uh, trying to figure out. Ultimately, we arrive at this idea that law schools care about LSAT. Um, yeah, somewhere between it's, it's two or three at almost every school. You know, the, there are a couple schools that are balancing it close to even Stanford and mm -hmm. Berkeley. If mm -hmm. you're a West Coast student, you want to go to, to the top law schools in the Bay Area. It's looking like LSAT and GPA are about the same, but it, it falls dramatically off of that. Like it, it's, you know, you, you end up with like looking at high ranked law schools yeah. um, or good, you know, po strong law, law schools, USC 1.65, Duke 1.77. That means they're weighing LSAT 77% more than GPA. Yeah. And then you're getting to Columbia at two, 2.0. And there's only like 20, 30 schools that, that care about LSAT less than that. Yep. All other, you know, remaining, we've got like 150 schools here that are weighting LSAT uh, at least twice as heavily as they're weighting GPA. Yep. I think it's interesting. We can actually maybe circle back to Eric's point, which we never got to discuss earlier. Um, Eric made the point about U.S. News and World Report. Ah, yes. Good point. Okay. Right. And, and we never actually talked about this, but Eric says, um, us news and world report weights LSAT 0.1125 at 29% over GPA 0 0.0875 in their, um, <laughs> evaluation of law schools. So they're looking at LSAT as 11% of the game and GPA at 
eight and three quarters percent of the game. Mm -hmm. So that so they think that LSAT is 29 percent more uh, useful than GPA. And Eric says, well, that law schools give significantly more weight to LSAT than U.S. News and World Report suggests that they find it useful beyond what it means for their rankings. That is interesting. That is super interesting because. Well, that echoes what Dean Z said. What? They're concerned about your ability to succeed as a one. Yeah. Dean, Dean Z said, hey, I use LSAT for two reasons. It predicts your performance in law school. Yes. But I guess I'm still wondering why their ranking and their thus their on some level, their bottom line is still not the preeminent or predominant factor motivating their decisions. Right. And so I actually almost wonder if the LSAT helps with these other factors, which in turn are things that U S news and world report ranking is also valuing. Like you might lose a little bit on the LSAT front, but you gain in all these other factors. And then overall that helps boost their ranking. I don't know. I'm, I'd love to get a breakdown of the U S news and world report ranking factors. Well, Hey, I mean, you know, a lot of law students, you, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of law school applicants, right? Mm -hmm. If you could only see somebody's LSAT or if you could only see their GPA, which one would you pick? Yeah. I mean, LSAT. <laughs> it's a no brainer. Yeah. Like you'd end up with a lot of people like me who are like really high LSAT, but not really very good students. Cause I just don't want to study or I'm a pain in the ass or whatever, but you'd end up with like, you'd end up with a lot of horsepower sort of. Well, even if you had high GPAs, the problem is someone who applies with a 4.0 and another person who applies with a 4.0, those could be two wildly different 4.0s, different schools, oh, I, different competitiveness. Yeah. I don't know necessarily what to take away from that. And I think law schools are say, facing that same challenge. Yeah. If I had to just put, you know, if it was a, you know, <laughs> survival of the fittest tug of war between just the LSAT, you know, it's like, okay, this group has 175 and higher LSATs. And this group over here has 3.9 and higher GPAs. And that's the only thing we know about them. So we have mm -hmm. no idea what the GPAs are of the 175 pluses. And we have no idea what the LSAT is of the 3.9s. And then you make them fight to the death in, um, you know, moot court. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yep. Uh, I don't know. My money's on the LSAT team. Well, it's a standardized test. So you, you just have a lot more confidence in its. Exactly. They had to perform predictability. On, yeah. On this test that they took recently, instead of like, what were your grades at some school that I don't know, a major that I don't know, 10 years ago, potentially 20 years ago, potentially mm -hmm. you're not the same person even anymore, you know, but LSAT is like, it's just, it's the one thing that it's not perfect by any means, but it's, um, it's just a lot you you can, as you said, Ben, you can be a lot more confident that you're comparing um, on a, at least on a similar scale, which you don't know that you're doing literally yeah. on GPA. It's like, well, some people got 4.3 for their A pluses and some people didn't. Except for this one funny like tidbit. A few years ago, the LSAT was 50% logical reasoning. <laughs> and now <laughs> it's not. So like, you know, what have, have law schools like even considered that as they've looked at applicants with, who have LSAT scores that are older versus ones that are newer, they probably don't care because it doesn't affect their U S news and world report ranking. I'm just like curious does, does that have any effect? It doesn't matter. I'm a, I continue to be amazed that no one else has even commented on that other than me talking to you. I've never heard anyone else even like, it's like not a. What never happened? No, it yeah. it did. It definitely happened. It definitely happened. They yeah. <laughs> they they changed the balance of their own test a lot, and yeah. just no no notice anywhere. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Also, you know, you can do a sensitivity analysis of your own by going to lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. Um, your GPA probably is constant. <laughs> Most people do not have a GPA that is going to significantly change, you know, which, which boy that, you know, if we think about how important it is to you as an applicant, 
Does any if of this GPA, matter if your GPA is well, fixed, right? If your GPA is literally fixed because you graduated four years ago, or if your GPA is virtually fixed because you're a junior or a senior in college and there's just not that much that's going to happen to change your GPA, or if we really consider how narrow GPA ranges just are generally, right? Like you can claim that there are 201 clicks on this scale, but there's great inflation that brings up the minimum. And I don't, I don't know, like it, it's just, it's just hard, hard to change your GPA and, and, and sometimes impossible if you've already graduated. I don't want to say it's easy, but it is <clears throat> common to change your LSAT dramatically. Like we expect you're going to improve by 10 points. No problem. And, and we are optimistic that you're going to improve your LSAT by 20 points. It doesn't surprise me when you do, you know, when you start at 150, I'm thinking, oh, good, let's get you, let's get you to 170. Well, here's the thing. And, and this was true even after we said, or we thought when we thought, Hey, some schools may be valuing LSAT 10 times as much as GPA. Even when we said that, at least for me, and I don't think it was for you either. Our advice did not change when it came to GPA first. Oh, by all means, yeah. And then LSAT if, second. And you're you're giving you're giving a hundred percent to your GPA. You're getting the best possible because it's still a it's still yeah. the <laughs> the one factor along with LSAT that matters a lot compared to everything else. We do know that. And what you're you still want to just get the best GPA you can because you can always improve your LSAT score later. And then at that point, once you're done with your GPA, well, then, like you said, I mean, does it matter how yeah. much they relate to each other? Because your, your GPA is fixed now. So the only thing you can really move that matters still is your LSAT score. And even yeah. then, it does seem to be more important than GPA, at least at the vast majority of schools. Yeah, grades first. If you're still an undergrad, I don't want you in my LSAT class unless you're getting straight A's. Yep. Because you're just like, you got to control the things that you can control while you can control them. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an undergrad, I want you to, I want you to personally weight GPA 100%. infinitely more than LSAT. Yes. A hundred percent. And then later you switch. <laughs> no, I literally want you to unsubscribe from the LSAT demon. I want you to stop paying me money because mm -hmm. I want you to get straight A's. Now, if you're getting straight A's and you want to study the LSAT, that's fine. But otherwise, I want you getting straight A's. I know I'm taking money out of my own pocket by doing this, but I just don't want you getting fucking A minuses and B pluses while also studying the LSAT. That's dumb. <laughs> what are you doing? Just take your time. Get straight A's. Mm -hmm. And come see me later. Like where the LSAT's not going anywhere. Law schools are not going anywhere. You have plenty of time. Don't be doing poorly in school. And, and just to be clear... Getting B pluses and A minuses is doing poorly in school. That's not OK. That's much better than I did. It's still shitty compared to like serious law school applicants. A minuses suck. On that note. <laughs> I mean it. Like, and, and if the ship has sailed, the ship has sailed. Right. So I'm not yeah, insulting so then don't you for worry your about previous it. performance. Yeah, because yeah, at that point, it's like, well, good. I can't control that anymore. I sucked in my undergrad. Yeah, well, good. Join the club. You sucked in your undergrad. Now let's crush the LSAT. But if you still have an opportunity to not suck in undergrad, then you should not suck in undergrad. <laughs> you should get straight A's in undergrad. Then go kill the LSAT because then you go to Berkeley and Harvard and Stanford and Yale. All right, let's change gears entirely. This is coming to us from Elizabeth, who is uh, one of our awesome LSAT demon teachers. Elizabeth says, this might be what you were thinking about in the recent podcast episode. And so we were talking about, I forget what we were talking about. We were talking about um, how to decide if you have to pick a house, for example, or if you have to pick a husband or wife, for example. And so this is talking about, I, I randomly pulled up, I, I, I knew that there was a magic number. Yeah. And so Elizabeth quotes, the magic figure turns out to be 37 percent to have the highest chance of picking the very best suitor. You should date and reject 
the first 37% of your total group of lifetime suitors. If you're into math, it's actually one divided by E, which comes out to 0.368 or 36.8%. We're rounding up to 37%. Then you follow a simple rule. You pick the next person who is better than anyone you've ever dated before. <laughs> and there's a link here. Uh, How the to... fuck would you know your total <laughs> know. group of lifetime suitors? <laughs> right. So the the Washington Post article uh, that is linked here, they yeah. they settle at some weird number of it's like, oh, 11, a total of 11 potential mates who you could seriously date and settle down with in your lifetime. This is an article from 2006. And then you pick um, the next, you pick number 12 after that, who's the best? Well, who's better than all the previous ones? Right. Which might take a while because it might be you know, 20. You've, yeah. You've dated now 37% of your total lifetime suitors, which I guess would be four out of 11. Right. So, and, and you have to reject them no matter what, because it's this yes or no type of a thing, right? You don't mm. get to just date all 11 of them and pick the best one. That would be simple. But that's not how dating actually works. It's probably not. It's also not how house buying works, right? You've got to like move on houses yeah. and probably how jobs works and that that type of thing. It's like, well, you've got to decide yes or no before moving on to the next thing. And so these mathematicians um, and I, apparently this has been happening since the 60s or forever. People have been trying to work on this problem, but they've settled at 37 percent. So what you do is you date 37 percent of your total lifetime suitors. So, yep. you know, if that's 11, then you've got to date four people. You've got to say no to all of them. Then you, so you go dating. into that relationship saying, look, I just want to yeah. get to know you. I'm not at 37 percent yet. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you have no literal chance because we're I, I got to get to 37 percent to give myself the best the best possibility. <laughs> OK, got it. But, you know, and, and if it's 100 people, right, if you're yeah. if your lifetime number is 100 then that means you've got to date 37 people, turn them mm -hmm. all down. And then the next one who's better than everybody you dated those. previously yeah. is the one you marry. Mm. I guess it yeah. also assumes that you stay married. Uh, so there's lots of problems with this analysis, but <laughs> that's I'm just really, I'm really trying to understand the practical <laughs> implication other than maybe it's better to have a little more experience when making a final decision. You got to make sure you go see multiple houses and say no to them. Yeah, that's what they're saying here is that you've got to you've got to say no to a certain amount of these things. You, you can't take the first one, which I think mm -hmm. we all know. Despite what many of us actually do um, in our lives, getting you know married at 18 or 19 or whatever, the, the yeah, it's the mathematicians think that you have to. You've got to turn down 37% of your total lifetime pool and then settle down. And that the same goes for jobs and homes and uh, whatever else. Anyway, just a side little note and a follow up from a previous episode. Uh, we have a couple emails here from international students. Uh, let me I'll read because I'm going to read this fast. This is from Santi. It says, good morning, Ben, Nathan, and Demon Team. I'm Santi. I'm a student athlete from Argentina. I spent my last four years in the States, and I will get my BD, I guess that's a bachelor's something, in December with a GPA between 3.15 and 3.20. I'm planning on taking the LSAT in August and September. My F1 visa status does not allow me to take as much time as I wish to prepare for the LSAT. My status is valid only if I am enrolled in an institution and attend class daily. Fortunately, I have one year OPT, which is legal permission to work in the USA, focusing on my bachelor's field, which we don't know what that field is. And he doesn't need to be in school during that time. He will use that between December of 2022 and August of 2023. So what he's saying is he really needs to start school in 2023 or else he's going to get kicked out of the country. Or, you know, be forced to stay here illegally, which is not a good move if you want to try to work here legally at some point. I'm a big fan of your program, LSAT Demon, and the podcast. I use the free account. I drill, do time sections, and review videos, and all the YouTube videos you guys make. At the moment, I can't buy the premium programs. I assume that's because of financial issues. Thank you, Santi. We really appreciate people who study with us for free. Uh, we do believe that there are 
the best free resources that you can possibly get uh, at lsatdemon.com. Just sign up for a free account. We'll start inviting you to some free live classes on Zoom. There's tons of drilling videos. There's all kinds of shit you can do there. Written explanations. Anyway, I got my first practice test last week and got 144. Not bad, huh, Ben? No, it's a pretty typical starting score. Yeah. From there, I would, you know, expect you to get into the 160s and hope that you get into the 170s. Yep. I found my biggest problem in logical reasoning and reading comprehension is the fact that I'm not quick enough to read the passages doesn't allow me to achieve any LR question after the number 13. Of course, I took a guess in those remaining ones. You can tell here, you know, I've corrected already a whole bunch of little grammar issues. So you can tell just at a glance that Santi is not a native English speaker. Um, obviously, we know that Santi is from Argentina. Regarding reading comp, I did not even start the third and fourth passages. I just took a guess. Logic Games was a decent performance. I learned English just four years ago. I did not speak English at all, all caps, before coming here. And there is my biggest problem, which, yeah, I a thousand percent agree. Santi, you are definitely dealing with a language barrier here. And, um, you know, the LSAT is a serious test of English. So I feel you. Questions and concerns. Number one, how can I improve my reading? Number two, any writing course slash tips recommendation? I need to look professional in my English writing. Three, can international students with F1 status receive academic scholarships as normal Americans do? Four, chances of improving by 20 points in three months. Be honest. Guys, I have only one phrase in my head, and it is don't pay for law school. And that's my goal. LSAT score in the highest 160. And my 3.2 GPA will be more than enough to get some full ride offers in the top 100 and many in the lower 100. That's what I want. Any advice and <laughs> critics, criticisms will be accepted coming from you. Thanks for providing free content. It helps a lot. Cheers, Santi. All right. So what do we say to Santi, who spoke no English four years ago, who currently, you know, is just like obviously not native English speaking, 144, struggling with LR and RC, hoping to get a full ride to law school with an application coming up next well, shit, the application has to be this. Fuck, I wish he didn't have to rush into it so much. Yeah, so four questions. You want to do them rapid yep. fire? How yeah, can I improve my reading? So <laughs> look, Santi, I know you're trying to save money um, by not getting the demon. Um, two options here. I, I, I guess what I'm thinking in my mind is the best way for you to get good at reading is to do reading comp passages from lots of tests and get dinged when you get questions wrong, right? Like learn where you misunderstood something. You need to be looking up vocabulary words that you don't know, and you need to be memorizing words that repeat themselves. So if you look up a word, write it down on a list, and then, you know, you see that word again on a different reading comp passage, that's a word you need to memorize if you haven't already. I'm not telling you to memorize all vocabulary words that you don't know, just the ones that you see more than once. But if you get the basic package for $95 a month, I know it's $95, but you can start, you, you open yourself up to, you know, hundreds of reading comp passages. That's my two tips yeah. for reading comp. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to answer it without a demon subscription. You, you need to be reading and writing in English every day as much as possible and exclusively if possible. Mm -hmm. I, every time you speak Spanish, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. I think that you need to be immersing yourself fully in English. If like, hey, you're you're asking me, how do I improve by 20 points on the LSAT in three months? You need to stop speaking Spanish. You need to stop reading Spanish like you. <laughs> you should like you should you should like. Disassociate yourself from your friends and family like you, you should really only speak English. You should yeah. only read English. You should watch TV in English. You should, you have to stop. You have to not speak Spanish. 
<laughs> if you're going to do this, like really to give yourself the best chance, you need to work on your English more than anything else. And the way you do that is by immersing yourself in English. So you need to read and write in English exclusively, if possible. Yeah. I wonder if Santi can apply for a fee waiver because yes, then he could get, bas- the- get a basic account for three, for four months for 30 bucks. Ben's yeah. coming back to the demon subscription, which yeah. is fine. Look, Definitely I know apply. it's self-serving, but check this out. I mean, he's got to get this score by August. Time yeah. is a more problematic issue here I than I think money is. And I, I, I'm trying to figure out a way for him <laughs> to agree. get that feedback. Because I agree. It, even if he reads something in English, if he doesn't get any feedback about how that's correct True. or wrong, it's not going to be as useful of a time. And we're talking right. orders of magnitude here. So I know it's self-serving, but I also <laughs> just, I think it's the answer. Well, there's another answer. There's an intermediate step in between here and there, which is yeah. at the very least, get yourself a prep plus account, it, you know, apply for the fee waiver. If you get the fee waiver, awesome. Fee waiver then gets you four four months of demon. Basic Two free for, LSATs. For free yep. or for $30 yeah. total, which is nothing. So that's just the fee that LSAC charges us, by the way. Um, yes. Apply for the LSAC fee waiver. Step one. If you don't get the fee waiver, you still need to buy an LSAC Prep Plus account. I thought I thought that too, Nathan, but there's not the feedback. There's not the Yeah, okay. but the test. Okay, fine. But Ben, yeah. I'm assuming he has literally no money. Okay. I'm taking him at his word. He said, I can't buy it. I can't purchase yeah. anything premium. Yeah. Okay, if you can't, if you literally can't, you have to get yourself a Prep Plus account. That's not a premium program. Yeah. I agree with you, Ben, <laughs> that a demon account would help a lot. Hopefully you get the fee waiver so we can then give you our help for free. Yeah. If you don't get the fee waiver, then I don't know. Then, yeah, it's not as efficient. You know, like I, I agree, Ben. <laughs> I know I'm being kind of mean to Ben, but I want Santi in our in the demon. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think we can help Santi a lot. But okay. you at the yeah. at a bare minimum, yeah. you need to be doing the LSAT, right? He needs to be doing all LSAT all the time. I actually think that there's no better way for him to get better at English than the law school admission test. With that feedback in particular, right? We see people yeah. do this, even native speakers, they read things, they read The Economist or whatever, and then they're like done reading it. And they're like, oh, wow, I, you know, I um, I understood that. And it's like, did you? We have no yeah. way of knowing. We have no way of knowing. Yep. If I start asking you questions about it, you might fuck it up. And then it's like, well, you actually didn't. So you're just... Developing. Yep. Okay. Yes. Next slowly. step. Any writing course tips or recommendation? I need to look professional in my English writing. I say you're wasting time thinking about that. You just need to work on the LSAT. Like it'll naturally, your writing is going to get better if you just work your, it's your English that needs to get better. You don't need a writing course. You just need to have better English. I did have one idea to the extent okay. that you do any writing. Again, time is your most valuable asset here. But to the extent that you do any writing, just get the free Grammarly plugin in Chrome. And then it will correct yep. the mistakes you're making and take note of those. Don't just accept them. Look at them and say, what the heck did I do wrong there? And then learn from it. Okay. Yeah, I have the same plugin in Safari. It seems to work. All right. Number three, can yep. international students with F1 status receive academic scholarships the same as normal Americans do? As far as I know, yes. As far as we know, yes, been doing this for a long time. Never heard anybody say I can't get scholarships because I'm on an F1. Chances of improving by 20 points in three months. Be honest. I don't know. If you, if you, if you can't get a prep program, it's going to be harder. Yeah, for, I, I can really only speak for our students, right? The people that we actually work with. Yeah, because we don't work with the people we don't work with. So I don't know. What like just using are. the free account, you're going to run out of tests. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like the the analysis that the law schools do, of course, you can't trust their advice because they don't want you to be a better applicant. They just yeah. want you to apply. Yeah. But the analysis that seems to be out there is like, well, you know, people don't really improve on the LSAT. They only improve by if, when they retake the LSAT three months later, they only score on average a couple points higher. So, you know, you really should only take it once or twice, which is just fucking garbage because our students improve by 10, 15, 20, 25 points all the time. If you were with us, Santi, the odds would not be zero that I know for sure. Like, is it, is it 50%? 
No, it's something south of 50%. 20 points in three months, it's not a 50-50. It's it's less than it's less than, you know, even if you had a demon live subscription, I still don't like expect you more often than not to improve by 20 points in three months. That said, when you do improve by 20 points in three months, I go, OK, cool. Like, yeah, yeah it's not crazy, mm -hmm. not crazy at all. 144 yep. to 164 in three months. Not crazy at all. Like I've seen it happen just dozens of times. I mean, <laughs> we've sent like how many people in the one seventies did we have in this last cycle? Like a hundred. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's not shocking when people do that, but it's also not a, um, it's not a sure bet. It's not even a, uh, a good bet. Yeah. I, I would say it's a, uh, yeah. 33%, 37% going <laughs> back to the thing we were talking about earlier. If you're studying with us, Santi, I'll give you 37%. Okay. That's it. That's it for Santi. We have a similar one here. I'm not sure if this is going to have shed any additional light, but why don't you just read this quickly? Sure. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I've been listening to your podcast for a few months now, and I really appreciate all of your advice and tips, but I've noticed that you guys don't really talk a lot about how international students should approach the process. I apologize if you have, and I've just missed that episode. I've actually noticed that most law school admissions resources don't talk a lot about international students, which to some degree is understandable since I know not many international students apply to law school in the U.S. I was wondering if you had more insight on how the process, admissions, scholarships, etc., might be different for someone like me who is considered an international student because of their visa status, but lives in the U.S. and has attended both high school and undergrad in America. I think it matters not. I mean, I think the I don't reason think it why matters they don't talk either. about it is that it just doesn't matter. Go but ahead. At the end of the day, they're not reporting, right, like GPAs for international students somehow separately from their just GPA well, number. Does U.S. News care? I don't think so. Does No. Nope. Do, do, is it on the If anything, it reports? helps you. Right? I don't it, think so. It oh, adds yeah. to their diversity, like. You know, advertising. It's totally. like, look, we have this many international students. Cool. Well, especially because I, you know, at least this is how it was in my MBA program. When I did my MBA, yeah, there were, it was a small program. There were four students there on a full ride, me mm -hmm. and three other people who had really high GMAT scores. We mm -hmm. were all Americans. Mm -hmm. There were other people there on partial scholarships, almost exclusively Americans. And then there were a whole bunch of international students who were there who were paying full price. Mm. You know, it's like wealthy international students coming to the U.S. to get an MBA. Mm. And they were essentially the ones who were footing the bill for the program. Yeah. So to your advertising point, Ben, it, you know, if coming from wherever Santi's coming from Argentina, this anonymous uh, correspondent is coming from somewhere not in the U.S., I think that like the schools would consider themselves sort of like planting a flag in that other place. Right. Same it's like, we accept, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. look at this Argentinian who got their JD from our school. And, you know, if you have the right numbers, then there's no reason why they wouldn't give you a scholarship. Ultimately, their goal is, though, to get people from <laughs> that place to come and pay them full price because that's how they make their money. But anyway, go ahead. Sure. This correspondent continues, I have a 3.98 GPA at a T10 public school and I graduate in the fall. Sweet. I'm studying. I'm Yeah, that's great. I'm studying for the LSAT right now and aiming for a 170 plus. I plan on applying in the upcoming cycle and am wondering how law schools will evaluate me differently because of international student status. Will this also impact the kind of scholarships I'll get, if any? No. I've... I haven't been able to find resources that would help me evaluate my situation. So I'm really hoping you can shed some light. Thank you. Yeah. Um, look, you got the numbers. Yep. The numbers is the cure. <laughs> my hypothesis so many is problems. that there are, yep. yep. I don't think there are any resources because I don't think there need to be any resources because as far as I know, law schools don't give a fuck. Yep. They want your LSAT and your GPA. Your GPA here is from the U S that's even easier for them to understand the right. process. I, I, you know, Santi might have a slightly different issue because Santi, when you get the credential assembly service and you upload your transcripts from Argentina, 
that 3.15 or 3.20, who knows what that's going to look like on your transcript, uh, on your credential assembly service, like on your LSAC adjusted GPA, who knows what that's going to look like. And so in some cases, the GPA is not even reportable. If you don't have a reportable GPA, then it's just all about the LSAT, which for Santi would be good because his GPA is low anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but anonymous 3.98 from a U.S. school, that's 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 badass. 170 anything and you should be going to top 10 and top six, top three law schools and getting multiple full ride offers from schools, you know in the top 14 or right around, right? Like top 20 schools for sure. The Georgetowns mm -hmm. and UCLA's and those kinds of schools that are always in and out of the top 14. Those schools are going to be offering anonymous a full ride. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Thank okay. You. Yeah. This one, um, this last one, this came from one of our current students and it was a wall of text and I boiled it down okay. <laughs> to this. Yeah. It's still kind of a wall of text. And I. There were too many issues in the one email. Everybody, y'all need to write shorter and you need to just keep it to fewer points. But. I wanted to just see what your take was on this issue. Do you, okay. you want to read it? Sure. Here's a mini dilemma I'm facing. I received an F almost 1.5 years ago before transferring to community college. Uh, okay, so maybe in high school, space, comma. <laughs> space. I, I just, I, I just want to point out that when people write long, it just makes their shit look. They just, you have so many opportunities for for typos and bad grammar and mistakes and repetitiveness. And, yep, and repetitiveness and just, I, I, I just, I really want to impress upon people. Like, you don't have to look professional to me. You don't have to look professional to Ben. Although, you know, we do hire former students a lot and <laughs> it, might, it might be good to look professional to us, but you don't have to, if, you know, if you don't what want about to. making it just a habit, like, well, that's what I'm saying. I yeah. don't know how many people who work for us now would send out anything close <laughs> right. to this. It's no like offense, if you drop F-bombs all the time in your normal conversation, then you're much more likely to drop F-bombs in front of your future mother-in-law. Or interview right? or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right. So or, or on your podcast. And so <laughs> you 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 want to just be careful about the way you're presenting yourself to the world. And this anonymous correspondent, you know, in your first damn sentence, you've got typos. And so I'm a professional person who went to law school and has a bazillion lawyer friends. And, you know, that to me, I look at that and I go, oh, that's not lawyer shit. Just saying, but go ahead. Yeah, I think what happens, by the way, I was going to say when people write long, what's happening, and I do this too, of course, is that they are fleshing out their ideas. And then when they're finally done, they've, they've clarified those ideas, but they don't take the time to go back yep. and boil them down. Okay. It's, it's I, a, you know, and it's like a bit of, there's like a respect thing going on, right? Like, mm -hmm. take, you could take some time, you could take, <laughs> Five damn minutes to edit this it would be nice that's all yep but i i i'm your i'm your servant you know like you i work for you <laughs> because you're a student of ours and so i understand that i provide you a service that you pay me for and you don't you don't necessarily have to you know show me respect that's not not what it really what i'm saying but for future readers you might want to take some time that's all well, there's definitely a self-interested reason to do this, though. The clearer you get in your messaging, the clearer and faster answer you're going to get back. Well, yeah, because I, you know, for one, when I saw this wall of text come in, I was like, oh, God, like I, I just didn't even want to respond to it. No. Right. Shorter bullets, well edited, tends to get a quick response. And I almost even last night when I was deciding whether to put this on the agenda or not, last night, I almost just sent it back and said, hey, can you can you shorten this down? Cause it's so much. And instead I took like half of it and put it in here and it, <laughs> yeah, I agree just for your own self-interest. If you want fast responses, you might want to put more into it in the first, not more words, fewer words. 
more, more work, fewer words. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So we got, <laughs> I received an F almost 1.5 years ago before transferring to community college space, comma, space. The F was a long story. It's a comma splice. So it's a bad sentence. It's a typo and telling us a story about getting an F. Okay. Yep. But space, comma, it does not count on my transcript. It is just there. I left community college with a 3.5 and I am now at university maintaining a 3.8. Okay. Now, I, I had no idea how, how the CAS GPA, that's LSAC GPA works, but apparently anything that's on your transcript in letter form is calculated. Space, period. Even... Though the F is not my official transcript, it's on my community college transcript. I fought relentlessly with my community college to take it off due to a number of factors, and many of the deans were on my side. Whoa, is this like a community like discussion? Space, comma. But since it's been almost two years, there is nothing they can do about it. Also, they are very impressed with the way I'm advocating for justice. Regarding my transcript. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm sorry. That to me is just laughable. It's like they're kissing your ass. They're te- oh boy, we really appreciate how hard you're advocating. No, we're not going to do anything about it. But we just, you know, boy, they're like, I, I don't know. That to me seems so condescending. It's like it does, patronizing, yeah. you know? It's like, oh, hey, look, we really appreciate all you're saying, but no. Oh, it's just why wow, you're, we, boy, this is really great. That is so great how you're out here advocating for justice. Oh, sorry. Those two years ago, we can't do anything about it. Yep. It, it almost seems like they're just trying to soften their message to you. Okay. Continue. The F was never justified according to the academic handbook and syllabus, but morally and ethically, it was justified. Huh? Now you're advocating in the other direction. But they did not give me the F based on the academic handbook and syllabus, which is according, which according to the schools is how they make disciplinary decisions and the only way they make disciplinary decisions. I'm, I'm actually a little bit lost here. I'm not sure what's going on. Yep. Okay. Obviously, that was a lie since they gave me the F based on ethics. That is why I was fighting rigorously, rigorously for it to be taken off. On the other hand, they informed me that I will be a great lawyer since I was fighting relentlessly for my own justice, <laughs> even though nothing happened in MG favor. My oh, favor? there's so many typos. <laughs> I think yeah. I think that this was written from a phone and there's just so many typos. It, it just, they're, they're telling you how great of a lawyer you are, but this ain't lawyer shit. Like this is, like this just, it's, it's very unprofessional looking communication. Um, anyway, sorry, proceed. <laughs> no, it's okay. So I will now be applying with a 3.5, sadly, exclamation point. My goal is T14, comma, I have an interesting story about myself, two words, and I've done many things on, many things an average 21-year-old has not done. Okay. I competed in bodybuilding and won my class, space, period. No space. I am a sponsored athlete for a very successful company, comma, no space. I launched my own online coaching platform, comma, started a successful LLC and contributed to Mental Health Awareness Month with something regarding my LLC. What are you even talking about? I don't understand, but okay. Therefore, I believe my personal statement will stand out tremendously. Not if you like list all these things. You Not if you write focus. like that. Yeah. And you got to pick a... Pick something. And it might stand out in the wrong way. Exactly. Now my question for you guys is the following. How bad is this F scenario? Your LSAC GPA is 3.5. That's how bad it is. It's it it that that's all that it means. It has affected your LSAC, your credential assembly service, UGPA is a 3.5. That's what the F did. Okay. Uh would you suggest writing an addendum? I would not suggest it. I think you're prone to write about justice and ethics and it's going to send the wrong message. If you tell this story, it is going to have the exact opposite of 
your intended effect. I mean, <laughs> you think about what's happening here. This is one of those fighting with a school. He's fighting, literally fighting with his school. Rigorously. And he's that thinking <laughs> that an application to a law school, he's thinking that an administrator at a school is going to find gonna take this his appealing. Side. Yeah. No, they're going to look at this and they're going to go, you're a problem. We don't want you. They would much rather just see your 3.5 and not think about it. You're drawing attention to the reason why they might dismiss you if you write that addendum. They do not want to hear this story. You got to think about your reader. You're thinking about yourself. You got to think about your reader. Yeah. Look, I'm sorry if this comes across as harsh, but I just, you, you, you got to step out of the way you're seeing this situation, which is what you're saying, Nathan. You got to see this from the perspective of your reader. You got to see this from the perspective of anyone else that's looking at this situation. And I am actually just confused. And well, <laughs> if, if I'm like the attorney, if I'm, if I'm this person's attorney, right? I'm like, like don't this talk. Is my client, I'll take care of it. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, that's step one with any client, right? <laughs> yeah. Step one with any client is you shut up. You yep. never speak ever. Mm -hmm. You do not speak. Nope. Yep. Don't talk ever. Shut up. <laughs> Not you. This is me. That's what you pay me for. You shut up. I will talk. This case. OK. The F is on the transcript. Absolutely. We did everything we possibly could to get it out of the record. Right. You just don't even want this to be in the record. So you, you do everything you can to try to get it off of that undergrad transcript. Then you just don't even address it at all. But it is on the transcript. Now, do we want to draw attention to it? Well, if we draw attention to it, what are we going to say? We're going to say, according to the academic handbook and syllabus, it was not justified. But morally and ethically, it was. What is it? Well, yeah. Mean? So he's he's acknowledging <laughs> that the F was based on ethics. But what did he do wrong? <laughs> well, I assume it's like plagiarism or I don't know. Like, how do you ethically get an F, you get an F that, and he's saying it is morally and ethically justified. So, okay. So this was some violation of code of conduct in some way. And you're trying to get out of it on this weird technicality where you're like, well, in the academic handbook and syllabus, if you get an F based on ethics, you can't get an F based on ethics. The only way to make a disciplinary decision is based on the academic handbook and the syllabus. And this is not based on the academic handbook and the syllabus. So you're not allowed to make a disciplinary decision. So I can't get a disciplinary F. This is because of an ethical violation that I made. <laughs> and then it's like, whoa, what? You're trying to like, you want to. Yeah, you're arguing for the letter about... of the law <laughs> rather than the spirit <laughs> of the law. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, exactly like it's like, oh, no, I did some super dirty shit. I did an ethical violation. I was wrong. I was morally and ethically wrong. Please help but me. The letter out. of the law says that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's certainly a conversation that you can have with the community college. And I'm glad that you were relentless in fighting it. I mean, that's awesome. You failed. But that's awesome that you tried. That's fantastic. But you need to say absolutely nothing about this to the law schools. Do not write an addendum. The second you start writing this addendum, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Guaranteed. Do not talk about any of this. Yeah. <laughs> we and get write, there? Write, write on your computer. Yeah. Write emails on your computer. Pick a lane on your personal statement. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> bodybuilding and sponsored athlete and launched my own online coaching platform and started a successful LLC and contributed to mental health awareness month with something regarding my LLC. And Oh, by the way, I'm 21 years old. You know, that all sounds like to, to adults reading this, um, older folk reading this, that all sounds like, oh, so you're 21 year old, 21 years old and you've dabbled in a bunch of things and you think you've done everything and you've really done nothing and typical. <laughs> like it just doesn't it doesn't stand out in any way. It looks just like 
every other naive 21 year old who thinks that they have all these accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And instead you need to pick one of these things. Yeah. You know, like focus on the LLC. I'd love to see that personal statement. Focus on the online coaching platform. I'd love to see that personal statement. Focus on the bodybuilding. Maybe I'd love to see that personal statement. But when you do all these things and you're 21, I go, oh, really? Okay. Um, well, maybe that's why you have a 3.5 and okay. <laughs> it's just not, it's not like, wow, look at all the things that you've done. Instead, it's like, oh, so none of these things, you didn't really do any of these things. You kind of did a whole bunch of different things instead of really excelling in one thing. That's why you've got to pick a thing and write about that thing. Yep. Thank you to all of our correspondents today. We really appreciate your emails, especially when you're telling us that we're wrong. You can be LSAT famous and tell us that we're wrong by emailing help at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, how to get the fee waiver, um, how the demon works, uh, you can email our amazing customer service team, help at lsatdemon.com. Please check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 351 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.